Hello, uh, my name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, April the 14th. We will sing several songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope uh, will lift us all up just a little bit. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. You may not have that book, but may desire to sing along with us. Uh, so I will give you the name of the song along with the number so that you can find it in your book or Google it so that you can sing along with us. The first song that we will sing this evening is number 609, I'm Not Ashamed to Own My Lord. 609, I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. <clears throat> I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to defend his name. Maintain the honors of his word, the glory of his cross. Firm as his throne, his promise stands, and he can well secure what I've committed to his hands till the declarative hour. Then will he on my worthless name be for his father's face. And in the new Jerusalem appoint for me a place. Number 771. 771. The title of this song is Lord Speak to Me. 771. Lord Speak to Me. <clears throat> Lord Speak to Me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me seek thy herring children lost and long. Oh, strengthen me that while I stand firm on the rock and strong in thee, I may stretch out a loving hand to wrestlers with the troubled sea. Oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious things Thou dost impart, and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. Oh, fill me with 
faithfulness, Lord, until my very heart o'erflow in kindling thought and glowing word. Thy love to tell, thy praise to show. And before the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 763. 763, O Master, let me walk with thee. 763, O Master, let me walk with thee. <clears throat> o Master, let me walk with thee in lonely paths of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the breath of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winding word of love. Teach me the way with thee to stay and guide them in the homeward way. In hope that sends a shining ray Far down the future's broadening way In peace that only thou can give With thee, O Master, let me We come to the part of the service where we observe the Lord's Supper as we are instructed to do on every first day of the week. Every first day of the week, we are to gather about his table, his precious table. Uh, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he did meet with his disciples in that upper room. He explained to them what was going to transpire very soon. And uh, with that, he let them and us know that... Uh, he would lose his life that we might gain ours. And with that, uh, he explained the, uh, the, I guess, uh, the symbols that were involved in the Lord's Supper, that it was his body and his blood that were so precious, his body that would be racked with pain on the cross, his blood that would be shed for the remission of our sins. So as we gather about the table, let's not make that an isolated event that happened 2,000 years ago, but let's make it something so fresh in our heart that, that we can hearken back and make it so relevant to us as Jesus gave up his life. Let's pray for the bread. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful in your divine wisdom that uh, you allowed Jesus to sacrifice him himself one time for all. That that sacrifice would be so wonderful for us. And through that sacrifice that uh, we might have eternal life with you. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember his body that was racked with pain as it was nailed to the cross. Help us to make that so personal to each one of us as we partake of this bread. We ask this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. In partaking of this fruit of the vine, we Remember the innocent blood that flowed from Jesus' 
head and his hands, his feet and his side. Uh, that life-giving blood that ebbed from his life, even though that blood took his life away temporarily, it gives us new life. It gives us the opportunity to have our sins forgiven. And so as we partake, let's lay our sins before you, knowing that through his blood that they are forgiven. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we do something else on this Lord's Day that we are instructed to do. We were instructed through Scripture to lay by and store that which uh, we have prospered, that uh, we should give back. We should give back to the Lord because he deserves to be given to. They did that in Old Testament days. They tithed to God. This isn't the same type of tithe, but rather instead of a tenth, it is what we have prospered. Help us to uh, remember how blessed we are as we give. Help us to make giving uh, just an integral part of our lives, especially at this time as we give back to the church. Let's pray together. We just thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for not just the opportunity to give, but for the privilege that we have to give back to you. We know that your church here on earth is a vehicle to bring others to the Lord. It is a vehicle to helping those that are in need. And we just pray that uh, those that uh, utilize the monies that are brought forth will do so as just stewards of your church that uh, Jesus died for. Bless us in our giving. Help us to give with an open heart because we know that you love a cheerful giver. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 579. 579. It's entitled, Praise the Name of Jesus. 579, Praise the Name of Jesus. <clears throat> Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. He's my rock. He's my fortress, he's my deliverer, in him will I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. I hope that you were able to sing along with us. I know that our Lord was praised and I know that we were lifted up through uh, praising his name as we are instructed to sing psalms and songs and spiritual songs back to him. If you were there this morning, you know that uh, we have been doing a series entitled Our Life Together on Sunday evening, and I am incorporating the title of tonight's lesson with <laughs> Our Life Together. And so the title of this evening's lesson is Enriching Our Life Together. We've looked at several aspects of our life together. We've noticed the intimacy of it and the uh, togetherness of it. We've looked at the parts of the Lord's Church and its interdependency. We've looked at some of the acts of worship and reviewing the concepts of acceptance and freedom in Christ, which is what we talked about last week. With this lesson, I would like to address the application side of this study of our life together. What can we do to enrich 
our lives together. Maybe you've seen some labels on, on uh, prepared foods that we buy. And sometimes it says that some of these foods are enriched with certain things. In other words, maybe enriched with vitamins or enriched with minerals. The, the word denotes that they are improved. They are better than they were before. And so this morning, this evening, I'm sorry, I want to look at our uh, enriching our lives together. And by the way, the New Testament uh, really emphasizes this and really uh, puts a, a really important aspect of our life uh, because we live in a very, very mobile society. And so this evening, we will look at the epistle of James and we will focus mainly on what we find there that deals with enriching our lives together. Now, the book of James, if we look at James 1.1, 1, 1, was addressed to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. It's especially full of advice for Christians who find themselves in a very mobile society. Wherever you're living right now, it may not be where you were born, it may not be the same town, it may not be the same state. Some of you may not even be in the same country. The Christians back in the first century, wherever they might be, needed a fellowship with one another. And they, they felt the need. It, it, I hate to use the term, it normalized the, the channels of association like family and friends. And so with that, let's look at some things that are involved in our, enriching our lives together. First, let's look at the do nots <laughs> because James certainly addresses some of the do nots. In other words, something, some things that we should avoid in trying to enrich our lives. In James chapter one and verse 21, it says that we should avoid all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. I take this to mean immoral behavior, immoral speech, which we'll address in a little while. Uh, a wise man understands the devastating effect of immorality in his life and nothing will destroy uh, a church more quickly than an abundance of sin within the congregation. Second, according to uh, James chapter two, verses one uh, through nine, uh, we're supposed to avoid partiality. Now, showing respect for people shows that we don't show partiality. It's, it's a malignant cousin of something called bigotry. It makes us sinners bigots before God. James chapter two and verse nine. Fellowship with Christ is designed to bring us together, not to divide us. So there should be no partiality. Third uh, on my list of things to avoid is the misuse of the tongue. Remember, uh, I said, uh, talked about speech. Uh, James addresses that for 12 verses in the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. And he just says that the tongue possesses a great power to destroy, especially in verses 5 through 7. When we use the tongue, when we say words that we shouldn't say, it reveals a shallowness on our part when it comes to praising our Lord. Uh, in hmm, old days, 
uh, you, you remember, I think it was in World War II, there was a, a Navy saying that said, loose lips sinks ships. And that can have the same effect on our fellowship together. We should avoid it. James chapter 4 verse 1 says that we should avoid selfishness. And he reveals that the root cause of such strife is nothing more than selfishness. He wrote earlier in James 3 verse 16, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing will be there. If we desire peace and harmony, like Paul talked about in Philippians chapter uh, 4, verses 4 through 6, um, if we desire that harmony in our fellowship, we must go beyond the egocentric attitude of our youth. And finally, the last thing that we ought to avoid that is on my list is speaking evil of one another. Do we notice how many of these things have speaking involved in it. James chapter 4, verse 11 and 12 addresses this. Here we learn that speaking evil of another will actually speak evil of ourselves. Do we wish to be guilty of that? With that, we also set ourselves up as judges, when there was really only one judge back in the Old Testament, there was only one lawgiver. And so all too often, we may be guilty of judging one another on our standards, according to our own personal standards. Now, we do know that there are a set of uh, Bible, New Testament uh, grounded ways that we ought to behave. And if a person sins, we're supposed to restore that person, but with kindness and, and goodness. Uh, we can't be speaking evil of one another because that's an indication that uh, we will uh, serve as vehicles of destruction for our congregation. With that, let's talk for a few moments about how to be proactive. Let's take the proactive approach to building and enriching our fellowship. So what are some of the things that we ought to do? Well, James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 uh, intimates that we ought to view challenges as opportunities. We need to understand that challenges are just opportunities in disguise a little bit. Uh, we, we work through difficulties. Marriages only work when we work through difficulties. And so a congregation can be better when we work through the difficulties, when we can see that through the challenges that we might have, that those can serve as opportunities for us to enrich one another. And then there's that wisdom thing. The whole book of Proverbs is about wisdom, but James inches really close in that in James chapter 2. 1 verses 2 to 4, where he actually says that we need wisdom within a congregation. And he tells us if we want wisdom, pray for that wisdom. We should seek wisdom as from God as individuals. And so also as a congregation, the wiser we are as individuals, according to what the scriptures tell us that we're supposed to be about, the better our congregation will be and the more enriched it will be. Third on my list is to maintain proper perspectives about our situations. Um, 
James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, lets us know that envy and strife can serve as a wedge within a congregation. But God gives us reasons to be thankful for whatever situation we are in. That's what Paul addresses in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 4, verse 11, to be to understand the situation that we're in and be content in that situation. If all members are willing to see themselves as God sees them, there may be no room for pride and envy. And so to enrich our congregation, we need to be, to pay close attention to uh, the perspective of what situation we're in. And then there's that tongue again that lashes out. In James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20, he says, Be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Very often in any groups, one of the dynamics in that group that make it work is communication between people. Poor communication, short-fused tempers will quickly destroy any relationship. You know, when Paul talks about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he, he lets us know that we should never, never, uh, just try to put everything on the back burner, uh, have an argument and say, well, we'll discuss it. No, you should, it should come out in the open so that we can, uh, settle it. And then we would be slow to wrath. In James chapter one, verses 22 to 27, he lets us know that we need to practice pure and undefiled religion. He says that we need to be doers of the word, not just hearers. Have you ever heard the term, let your actions speak louder than our words? That's biblical. When we attend to the need of the less fortunate, that's biblical. That's pure, undefiled religion. When we keep ourselves untainted from the sins of the world, I would contend that that's pure and undefiled religion. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our congregation was marked by the fellowship within the congregation that we are practicing, you know, maybe, maybe let's, we are practitioners of this kind of religion pure and undefiled. And how is this pure, undefiled religion shown? Well, in James 3, 13 and 17 and 18, again, it addresses letting our actions speak louder than our words. Let's especially look at verse 17 that says, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. In this, we show our wisdom by how we act. We show our wisdom in our conduct. I have two more things on my list. In James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, James addresses the need for prayer. You know what? It's hard to be angry with people if we're praying for them. And when we show others, and when we know that others are praying for us, it's not hard to love them. Don't be afraid if you've had an illness or you've had a problem and it has been brought before people and they pray for you, don't be afraid or don't be too proud to not thank those people for their prayers. When we're praying for each other, 
not only as our fellowship with our God strengthen, but our fellowship with one another is strength is strengthened. Therefore, we are enriched in our fellowship. And finally, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page. You know, we talked about not judging, but we know when someone is practicing immorality that we are supposed to attempt to restore them. That's what James chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 say. And uh, these scriptures are dotted throughout the Bible. When people stray from the faith, we lose the benefit of their fellowship with us. That's one of the hardest things. People that are within our fellowship that fall away, restoring them back and restoring them back to God not only saves them, but it blesses them with a renewed fellowship. You know, that's why we're told that we should not be upset when we have to endure persecution. Because through uh, dealing with persecution, we can become stronger. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. And so I become a more powerful Christian. Therefore, I am enriched. And if we are enriched as individuals within a church setting, our church becomes enriched. We've done a real quick study of the epistle of James to illustrate many of the good things that we can do to be enriching our lives together and some of the things that we ought to avoid so that our fellowship will not be denigrated. Indeed, the entire New Testament is filled with admonitions. Not only are we to enhance our relationship with God, but we are to enhance our fellowship with one another. Hence, what this series is all about, our life together. Let's let the Word of God be our guide and create in creating and maintaining our life together. And from this particular lesson of enriching our lives and enriching the life of our church and the lives of those within our fellowship. And so with that, sometimes we need to look and say, what is my relationship with God? What's my relationship with God and his children? Is it like it should be? Can we draw nearer to the Lord? It's a wonderful thing about a fellowship of believers. And that is we're all on the same path. If you're not on that path this evening because you have not taken Jesus Christ into your life as your Savior, and born, been born again through the waters of baptism, we offer you that invitation. If you need to uh, confess Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your former life, and need to be baptized for the remission of your sins, we offer that invitation to you this evening. If you feel that need immediately, contact one of us, and we will be there for you. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're, we're just so grateful that Jesus uh, not only died for our sins, but he died to form the church, the new covenant with God through Jesus Christ. And we, as members of the Lord's church, are the ones that are to be the hands and the feet of God. Help us as Christians to desire to to enrich our lives together, to make our lives together as we walk down this road uh, toward eternal life. Help us to, to care for one another. Help us to humble ourselves before you that we might be lifted up. Bless us in our fellowship, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to indeed uh, be desirous of 
it being a strong and powerful fellowship, a fellowship that will act on behalf of you to do uh, your work here on earth. Bless us in our relationship with one another as Christians, that we may be examples to one another, that they may see Christ living within us. Be with us this evening. Help us to look forward to the next time that we meet together. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love.